Father, this morning we ask you to come into this church building. We ask you to touch each one of us this morning, Lord, with your goodness, with your love. And Lord, surround us with your love this morning, more so than you have ever done before. I ask you to make yourself real to each and every one of us in here this morning, Lord, as we have come into your house to worship you. We have taken the time out of our schedules, and we've given you our time. And Lord, we just thank you for what you've done for us. And now that you have risen from the dead, Lord, what else can you do for us? All we must do is believe. We thank you, Lord, but we also ask you to help our unbelief. Lord, help us this morning to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. What love is Easter? What love is in Easter? That's the title of the message for today. And I got it titled 1-A-A-A-1. What love is in Easter? Every year we see millions of Christians. They're going to observe Easter in their churches. And a lot of them are even going to have a sunrise service. And like I said, yesterday we was in Walmart. Yesterday afternoon. Where he needed to pick up some eggs and milk. And we went to the one in um, Marietta, uh, uh, St. Mary, yeah, Marietta. I get the two mixed up just like she does all the time. Anyway, the milk there is a dollar and thirty-five cent. Eggs were eighty-five cent. Couldn't beat the price. And we drove all the way down there on electric, so didn't use any gas going down. I filled up my car. We had a thousand and fifty. Four miles, 59. 1,059 miles, and it took a little over eight gallons. So <laughs> try that in your car. <laughs> no, I don't think so. 1,059 miles, eight gallons of gas. So anyway, are they really doing what they're doing in Walmart for the glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, as I walked around in there, I felt a presence that was ungodly. I felt like there was a spirit in there that was very ungodly. And I walked out of I was over in electronics looking around while I was waiting on Marie to pick up the thing she wanted. And I happened to look that way against that far wall. It looked like a white costume person with ears about this long on the top of it. And I guess it was called the Easter Bunny. I was headed that way to look in the um, tools and stuff like that, you know, men's stuff. And there he was, and women were taking their children out of their baskets. He'd get the pictures taken with him. You could hear some of the mamas say, now you have to be good if you want this Easter Bunny to come to our house tonight and bring you candy. As we, to begin with, the reason I walked over in that direction, because Marie was over at the area where the food stuff was, picking up some stuff, and uh, I happened to walk past one of the owls. I was going to go down that owl, because we was looking for some stuff uh, in the house, and I looked down that owl, and there was standing room only. Yeah, there was no room that you could drive a buggy through. And I don't know what they were doing in it, because it was just like there was only room to stand. And it was a candy out, and it had all this Easter candy stuff on it. And so people were there, and they was doing that. There was the Easter Bunny, but I never heard nothing about Jesus. So is the Easter Bunny about Jesus? Well, it wasn't at Walmart when I was there. Uh, now, I'm not saying it wasn't Walmart's problem, and it wasn't Walmart's fault. But Walmart was cashing in on the Easter Bunny, I can say that. <laughs> uh, the Bible tells us the Easter Bunny and colored eggs and stuff 
happened probably about 600 years before Christ came to the earth. Uh, we read about what Ezekiel had to say. Now he goes further on back. He goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 10, which I'll get into in a minute. But it's a long time before Christ. And so if our churches are claiming to celebrate this Easter and it's Christ's resurrection, how come he hadn't even come to earth when they were celebrating it? And how come nobody knew when he died, even Mary and them, you remember from our Sunday school lesson, they didn't know until the Lord had told them, you know, and then they remembered. When the angel said, remember what he told you before, what would happen? So the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 8, and verse 16, speaking by the mouth of the prophet through the inspiration of God, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. He brought me into the inner court in verse 16 of the Lord's house. And behold, the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men. So there's about twenty-five men standing on the porch there. And he says, and their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they worship the sun towards the east. They were in God's house, but they had their back towards God. And they was worshiping the sun towards the east. Verse 17. Then he said to me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? I guess Ezekiel said, mm, I can't hardly miss it. I'm looking straight at it. I don't know what he said. Is it a light thing for the house of Judah that they commit abominations which they commit here? So God says this facing the east on Sunday morning is an abomination because they're worshiping the sun. They're not worshiping God. They're facing the east. They're worshiping the sun. And he said this is abomination. He said is it a light thing that they commit this here? For they have filled the land with violence. They've returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. And so what's happened here? Is God satisfied with this Easter celebration? It don't sound to me like he's too happy with it, does it? So he says, for this reason, therefore, verse 18, will I also deal in fury. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, Yet will I not hear them. And so what he's saying is come Sunday morning, all these prayers that they're making in these churches that are doing that, he's not hearing a word they're saying this morning. He said, and I'm going to do stuff to them. I'm going to hurt them. And I'm not going to feel pity for them. Oh, wonder why we got so many people dying of cancer today. Wonder why they got every kind of disease in the world today. Because he says, my eye will not spare and I will not have pity for it. So do you think God is happy with what's going on in the churches today? Think about it. They claim it focuses on the Christian community. And on the resurrection, they say it's just like Christmas focusing on his birth. And what do we know about Christmases and all that? But on these days that they claim that are supposed to be so sacred, then why do they worship the bunny rabbit and Easter eggs? Why do they have these Christmas celebrations? And why wouldn't they come to church on December the 25th when it was Christmas Day? If they're doing it for the Lord, then why would they do the things that they're doing? And so what do these things have to do with worshiping Jesus Christ? Did anyone in the Bible observe Easter? Did Jesus leave us instructions regarding these observances? If you keep Easter or Christmas, do you really understand why you're doing what you're doing? If we study the scriptures, we can, can we find instructions from God on how we're supposed to do Easter and Christmas. Well, we found out reading the Word this morning in 1 Corinthians 
chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, Jesus says two times, do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say color eggs. He didn't say have a sunrise service. He said to have the communion service. He said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Then he says in verse 25, take and drink. This is the spirit. This is the wine. This is my blood. This, this grape juice is like the blood of his poured out for this New Testament church. Where does he say to color eggs? Where does he say to have a Santa Claus? Well, I was trying to find out where this Easter thing came from in the Christian church. And so it led me to the Catholic Encyclopedia. An article on Easter is the oldest one that I could find. And it says in there that Easter is the oldest feast of the Christian church. It says in the Catholic Encyclopedia it is as old as Christianity is itself. But yet, it goes a little further back than Christianity. It goes about 3,000 years further back. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 10. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me, you'll see it. And so what did the apostolic fathers of the church, what did they do when we first hear them? Easter is found one time in the King James Bible only. And most of the scholars agree that the Greek word, P-A-S-C-H-A, Pascha, that is translated in Acts chapter 12 and verse 4, should have been translated as Passover. But however, it was translated as Easter. And when he had apprehended, Acts chapter 12, verse 4, him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. If the people were observing that holiday at the time, does it mean it was a Christian holiday? Or does it mean all the stores and everything was closed for their pagan holiday? Did it have anything to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, the Babylonian name for this goddess back then was I-S-H-T-A-R. Now, if you could say that it pronounces Ishtar, well, you would be wrong because it's pronounced Easter, E-A-S-T-E-R, but it's spelled I-S-H-T-A-R, pronounced Easter. It was observed 3,000 years before Christ. How is this a Christian holiday then if it's observing the resurrection of Jesus Christ that happened 3,000 years later? Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, please. Did Christ tell us anything about Easter before ascending up to heaven? He says, but verse 14, but I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also, verse 15, them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Here we see that Jesus hates them. Their doctrine, this doctrine of the Nicolaitans who, who made a stumbling block to the children of Israel. To the Christians today, this is a stumbling block. He says, verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Easter, Ishtar, Jezebel. Does that ring any bells, anything to your mind? which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, what does he say, Marie? And, and I will kill her children. 
and all the churches shall know that I am he which serveth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your work. And so what's going to happen to your children? What's happening to you right now out there in Pine Grove, West Virginia? People are dying of every kind of disease imaginable. And some diseases that aren't even imaginable, people are dying. 50 and 60 years old is the average lifespan of somebody living here in West Virginia. And why? Because they have forsaken the Lord. And prophecy is becoming fulfilled in their eyes. They have turned their backs on God. Oh yeah, some of them's living longer. Some of them's making it to 70 and 80. But for the most part, what's happening with most of them? Most of them are dying. They're dying younger. And so that name we looked at there, Nicolaitans. And Jesus hates his doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So who are these Nicolaitans? Well, these are people that follow Nicholas's doctrine then, aren't they? I want to tell you something. People who have many past relationships find it very difficult to bond or be joined to anyone, including the Lord, because their souls have become fragmented. They cannot join with anybody, and so consequently they cannot join with the Lord. And that's what this fornication with all these false idols is doing, causing people where they can't get a communion, a close relationship with God. They can't get a close relationship with each other. The divorce rates are sky high today. And the only ones that are staying married for the most part are out there in the world, not the churches. The churches have a higher di divorce rate probably than the world has. And why? Because their souls cannot knit with the Lord. They can't knit with each other because they've got all this fornication in their life. And all they think about is who they're going to have sex with next. They can't have a a healthy relationship with a man and a woman that they can't have a relationship with God either. Their souls cannot be knit, but yet the Lord said, Therefore, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined or knitted together with his wife. Their souls will become one, and they would become one flesh. This is not happening today. Why? Because of this mess that's going on. They've been taken down the road to this idolatry. And their souls are knit with every demon out there. And every lady thing that happens in the world happens to them. And so where does that leave them all? <laughs> They're following Nicholas's doctrine then, aren't they? They're following the way that uh, Nicholas says they should go then, aren't they? They jump at every chance to be joined by some demon influence. And so where does this St. Nicholas... Or Easter and all this stuff come from. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. And so... We can trace it all the way back now to Genesis chapter 10. When Babel. And what were they doing? They were taking the place of God. Nimrod was a mighty hunter in place of God. Nimrod was hunting for souls. He wanted to be knit with the souls of the people. And he didn't want their souls to be knitted with the Lord. You're going to be mine. And not the Lord. I'm going to have you. And so we see why God the Father hates the sun worship, Easter. And God the Son, well, then he hates his Christmas mass too, doesn't he? Because he says so. And so, why is it? Why are the churches doing this stuff? Is it because these churches really have another God? They may be using the name of Jesus Christ, but is it the Jesus of Nazareth? Is it the Jesus that was crucified on the cross for their sin? Or have they knitted their souls together with some demonic influence? Think about it. How are they living their lives? Demon influenced or godly influenced? 
This goddess is actually Samarius, the mother and wife of Nimrod, the mighty warrior who rebelled against God. And what's happened to him? He ended up getting killed in a hunting expedition. And what did his wife do? She married their son. And they had a, had a baby. And then he got killed. And they called him the sun god. These are the founders of the ancient religion that came out of Babylon. Babel, Babylon. You see where they're coming from? She claimed to be the wife of the sun god. She became widely known as the queen of heaven. Now who uses that title today? The queen of heaven. The Catholic Church. They claim Mary is the queen of heaven. The mother of God. We was watching a, um, a detective show last night on TV. Um, in um, England and one of the uh, one of the officers stood up and said oh mother of God look at what's happened Mary is not the mother of God they might be thinking she is but they're not referring to the Mary in the Bible they're referring to Samarius she is the mother of the sun God and that's what they're referring to their mother of God is the sun god. It's not the God who created us all. It's the sun god they're talking about, who is no God at all. And Jeremiah chapter 7. Listen to what Jeremiah said. You know, Ezekiel had his two, two things to say too, didn't he? Jeremiah 7, 17. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Look at what they're doing down there, he says. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, the women knead their dough to make cakes to who? The queen of heaven? Well, how could it be the queen of heaven if Mary hadn't been born yet? How could it be this in Jeremiah, five or six hundred years before Christ? How could it be Mary? It cannot possibly be Mary. It has to be Samarius. They're baking cakes. They're pouring out drink offerings. And God says unto other gods. And they provoke me to anger. In verse 19. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Goodness. People better wake up, huh? Are you listening to me today, church? You hear what I'm saying here today, church? Look at all the Easter dinners going on. Look at all the plays and the rest that the churches are doing today. Is it because of Jesus of Nazareth? Because if it is, he said to do what in remembrance of him? Have an Easter cantata? <laughs> or have communion? Remember his death? Did he tell us to remember his birth? No. Did he tell us to remember his resurrection? No. He told us to remember his death. I died on the cross for you. And so this observance is not about worshiping God or His Son. It's worshiping the Queen of Heaven. And she's not just the average whore. But she has whored herself with her own son. She's had sex with her own son and got pregnant and they had a son together. Revelation chapter 2 verse 22. Did Jesus say she needed to repent? Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. God is still ready to forgive people. You just got to stop what you're doing. You can't just keep on doing and doing and doing. I noticed leaving Pine Grove here the, the other day. There was a bunny rabbit almost as tall as somebody's house out down there today. All glowed up and shining and everything. But what did they, what was around the house that could tell you something about the Lord Jesus Christ? Huh? Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16. He brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. The temple of the Lord. They were worshiping, he says. 
with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And the last part of verse 16, and they worship the sun towards the east. So what is Easter? Sun worship. It's not Jesus Christ's resurrection, it's sun worship. You say to us today, have you seen this, O oh child of man? Have you seen what the people are doing? Have you seen what the people are doing in Walmart today and yesterday? And you see the outfits they got some men or women dressed up in, running around like they're a rabbit. And we know that rabbits don't grow six and seven feet tall. And rabbits don't lay eggs. And not a one rabbit could ever die for my sin. And so, I heard somebody say, I wonder why our children can't go to school today. Didn't God say what was going to happen to the calamity of them? Didn't He say that they was going to have all these problems because of their confusion and now they're wanting to take away people's arms when they do that we have no more constitution and we're going to be just like china or russia or some other nation without a free will without a, a constitution we become a governed people we will no longer have freedom of speech because when they take away the freedom to use our guns to defend ourselves, then they're going to take away our rights to free speech as well. We will have no constitution. And so that means we're going to be going into a time in history that's going to be an irregrettable time. There's going to be lots of people die over it because a lot of men and women are not going to want to give up their guns. They're not going to want to give up their free speech and they're going to have to be eliminated. The scriptures here that we've looked at this morning are referring to a time before Christ. As a matter of fact, several centuries before Christ. Now, if it was today, and we talked about something that happened 600 years ago, do you remember what happened back in 13 and 1400? All you can think of is like a fairy tale in 1492, Columbus sailed from from England here to America. Look how things have changed since then. And we still haven't gone 600 years yet. And now we're talking 600 years from these people, from the birth of Christ, all the way back is when they began this. No, this is when Ezekiel and Jeremiah was talking about. It, it began almost 3,000 years before Christ. So they're going to say it's by Christ? Come on. It has nothing to do with Christ. All it is about is worshiping pagan idols. Passover is observed annually on the 14th day of, of the month of Nisan. Okay? And it was observed by the early Christians. And that's what they were talking about in the book of Acts. Let us go up until Passover was finished. Okay, this is an observation that all Christians and, and the Jewish people done as well. However, many years after Christ ascended to heaven, Pope Sixtus, S-I-X-T-U-S. I, I wonder where he got his name from. Well, he got his name Sixtus because he was infatuated with Sixtus. And every all of his teaching and all the stuff dealt around his infatuation with numbers, and especially the number six. And he began making people switch to Easter, the pagan holiday, from Passover, which God had come up with. The apostles had been instructed by Jesus Christ. They continued to keep the Passover. As Apostle John taught the disciples at that time, and all the early church done the same thing. But Easter was officially adopted by the Church of Rome around the time of Constantine in 325 A.D. Easter was to be kept on the same Sunday throughout the whole world. Okay? And it was back 
by the church in Rome by Emperor Constantine. And it became a law. If they caught you observing Passover, then you would go into jail, and you likely will probably never get out of jail because things would happen to you. And so with the power and the great size of the Roman Empire at the time, backing this pagan Easter practice, the people were taken. And they were put in arenas. And we read about and we've heard about the arenas where they fought the beast at Ephesus. They fought wild animals. In other words, they were destroyed in front of people to make people be afraid. If they didn't do the Easter, they would be getting thrown to the lions and be eaten. And so, you know what? That had a pretty adverse effect on a lot of people because their faith wasn't that strong to begin with. They wasn't willing to die for their Lord. So, yeah, we'll do Easter. Just don't kill me. Yeah, we'll do Easter. Just give me what I want. And that's why I said the other day, how many in here is going to take the mark? Because just as soon as they take your money away from you, or as soon as they take your doctors away from you, what's going to happen? You're going to take the mark? Well, if you do the same thing that these earlier people did, you will. Because they celebrated Easter like they was told. And if they didn't, well, then things happened to them. You're going to have to make that same decision here before very long. You're either going to take the mark or you're going to become an outcast. You know, so it's up to you what you're going to do. They call these kinds of people, I'm going to spell it because I can't even pronounce it, and it's spelled Q-U-A-R-T-O-D-E-C-I-M-A-N-I. Porto de Semini. Porto de Semini. These are the kind of people, like we would say a felon today. These were Porto de Semini. Or I don't know if I'm even pronouncing that right. So if you look at me and I've done the wrong thing, oh well, you figure out the right one yourself. I spelled it. So anyhow, I don't speak uh, fluent Greek. <laughs> I don't speak English very well, <laughs> let alone speak with Greek. And so these people were destined to become outcasts, and they were destined to be put to death in public view. Now, which would you do then? They come to your house, you're going to have an Easter bunny in your front yard, or you're going to have something about Jesus in your front yard. So how do pagan uh, colored eggs fit into this festival? by a Catholic church. Well, again, this is in the book of Acts as well, where we get the Easter egg from. It's in the book of Acts. I don't know if you're all aware of it or not. So turn with me to Acts 19. This mystic egg of Babylon that was hatched was actually Venus, or Ishtar, which fell from heaven down on the Euphrates River. Acts chapter 19, in verse 25, I'll begin. He said, Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know by this craft we have our wealth. Now here's, here's a man that's making a living selling these idols of Diana. Okay, this Ishtar. Same thing. Diana is Ishtar. And he said, Moreover, you see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul <laughs> hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship him. So he's admitting that all these people are worshiping this goddess Diana, isn't he? Okay? But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. For two hours they chanted, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of Ephesians 
is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Jupiter. This is the egg, the great goddess Diana, this image of her that fell down from Jupiter. This is what they're worshiping, a demon goddess. Not the Lord God Almighty, not Jesus Christ, but a demon goddess. And this is what our churches are worshiping today, and they're claiming, and they're taking, and trying to impress some demonology on the people and say this is our Lord and Savior. When they thought that man was putting their money in jeopardy, they chose their money before they chose God. Isn't that what a lot of people do in the churches today? They choose their money before God. Dyed eggs were sacred Easter offerings in Egypt, as they were in China and in Europe. Easter or spring is a season of birth, whether terrestrial or celestial. And I read somewhere that somebody said this. I don't remember where I found it from. He says, an egg of wondrous size is said to have fallen from heaven into the river Euphrates. The fish, the fish rolled it to the bank where the doves having settled upon it and hatched it, out came Venus, who afterward was called the Syrian goddess. And so this goddess was hatched. Now you know snakes have eggs too, don't they? Just like chickens, snakes have eggs. The Syrian goddess of the Syrians was called Astarte, A-S-T-A-R-T-E. And so this Astarte is pronounced in our English language today from the Syrian language as Easter. Crazy, huh? Many today use Easter eggs as a child's play in modern times. But look at the origins of it. It's all pagan. And God says, observing that pagan holiday, in Ezekiel chapter 8, and verse 17 says, Has thou seen this, O son of man? It is a light thing at the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit there. For they have filled the land with lies and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put a breach to their noses. So God says, I'm going to lead them around by their noses. I'm going to stick a stick up in their nose and lead them around. Yes, that's what he's saying to them. I'm going to do things because they may be angry with them. And so, what does the Bible say? In 1 Corinthians, Marie, again, chapter 11, please, and verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And verse 24 says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And what else? This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, verse 25, he took the cup. When he stopped saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do you, as often as you drink it, what? In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. Nothing there about Easter eggs, was it? Nothing there about Santa Claus, nor the Easter Bunny, but to remember his death. The Apostle Paul wrote this as Jesus himself commanded. These verses describe how for us to keep the New Testament Passover. We are not Jewish. We are non-Jewish people here. But we have been grafted in to Christ like an olive branch is grafted onto another branch. We are not the Jewish people. We are the New Testament church. This is our covenant with Christ. If you are a Christian this morning, this is your covenant with Christ. This is the part 
that you do in remembrance of him for what he has done for us. If you don't bother to go to church, like my son this morning is not here again, if you're like a lot of people that have not bothered to even come to church this morning, how are you going to do what the Lord said to do? How can you come together and have a communion? None of my children are in this church this morning. Are they in churches somewhere in America? I don't know. But I can tell you one thing. If they're not keeping God's covenant, they're keeping the world's covenant. And if they're doing that, then what do you think God is? You think he's happy with them? I don't see how. Because the Bible says to me that he's angry with them. Because of what they're doing. They're worshiping the son. And how come when they have godly parents that are in church all the time, how can the children not be? It's their own way, isn't it? They choose to do their thing. So we all have to make a choice this morning. And you can choose the world and all that's in it. And one day you're going to die. And for all the things that you choose and all the things that's in the world, they're going up in smoke. And only if you're going to choose to serve the Lord are you going to be with the Lord in eternity. And so that also makes him a thief this morning too because they've stolen their time that they should have been with God. And Malachi chapter 3, you might say, well, I'm not a thief. Well, maybe you ain't. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 7, he said, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I'll return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? What's the next statement, Marie? Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? And verse 9 says what? You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And so, not only are the people robbing him of his glory, they're also robbing God of his money. How can this be? And they call themselves Christians. Just ask yourself, how can this be? They don't take out the time to come and worship the Lord, and they don't and they don't pay the tithes and offerings. And so what does that mean with their relationship with God? They don't have one, they do that. They have none. Because their relationship is built on some demonic lie. Well, they, with these demon lies within them. They cannot have a soul tied with the Lord. It's, it's just about impossible for them to get right with God. And yet they go about acting like they're pretty good people. Oh, I'm doing a good thing and I'm helping this person. I'm helping that person. Well, what have you done for the Lord? What have you done for Jesus Christ today? And you call yourself a Christian. I believe God has another name for you. And I don't believe it's Christian. What does the Pope say? Yeah, and then yesterday on uh, on the news, on the internet, we see the Pope up there. What's he saying? There is no hell. Yeah. That's what the Pope said. There is no hell. Yeah. He said, people to get right with God go on to be with God in eternity, I guess. Now, he didn't even really know about that part. He never said that. But the people that don't, he doesn't punish them. They just disappear. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Marie, please. <coughs> okay. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In verse 5, though. I tell you, nay. <laughs> But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We have to understand where we're at this morning with God. Are you in the right way or are you in the wrong way? Are you doing what God wants you to do this morning? Or is it all about you? Because if it's all about you, then aren't you going to be where you're going to be? 
You know, when Jesus left to go up into heaven in Matthew chapter 28, he says in verse 18, he come to them and he spoke and he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now wait a minute. He says, all power is given to him. Well, they got the power to stay home on their own this morning. But I thought Jesus said all power was given to him. <laughs> they got the power to keep their money and don't want to tithe and pay offerings or nothing in the churches. But they, they realize that all power is given to him. But what are they doing about it? They're doing what they want to do, aren't they? And then he said in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. Well, what happens if you don't do it? What he says, he still will be with you to the end of the world? Are you going to take that chance? Are you going to take a chance of going to hell for a few lousy dollars? Or a few little bit of minutes to spend coming to church, worshiping God? Or are you going to worship Easter, Ishtar? The goddess of fertility. Oh, she gets a lot of praise today because the world is wrapped up in sex. Sex and violence. That's all they're looking for. But a few people want to follow his commands. Most of the people want to follow the pagan rituals. What have you done with your children this morning? Have you lied to them the way I heard that woman lying to her child yesterday in Walmart? You better be good if you want the Easter Bunny to come tonight. One time I went to an AA meeting with a friend. I just went there because he kept talking about it and how it was helping him and all this. He said, you need to come. I said, well, I don't drink. He said, no, but it might help you. I said, okay, I went with him. And I heard the teacher say, I'm, well, I'm going to say the teacher. I don't know if he was really a teacher or not. But he told the people in there, and he kind of acted like he was running the thing, you need a higher power than yourself. But is that higher power God? Or is it some other being that is claiming to be God this morning? Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 says, Let all the souls be subject to the higher powers. Where there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. So that being said, this morning, if you have a higher power, is it just a little bit higher than yourself? Or is it the most high God? Think about it. If you're observing Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, you have a higher power. Because you're worshiping these things. Don't tell me you're not worshiping. Because if you're doing this, you're going to Walmart or wherever. And you're buying stuff. And you're giving away candy to children. If you're, if you're going to some Easter cantata this morning or yesterday. Or you've been the one. You've given it to all that mess of the world. And you haven't given it to Christ. And so you have a higher power. But is that higher power God Almighty? Or His Son, Jesus Christ. Or the Holy Spirit. The three in one God. Are your, is your higher power God? Or is it somebody who claims to be God? Like the Nicolaitans teachings tell you. And so, John chapter 16 and verse 7. Jesus is speaking. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, what is this Comforter going to do when he comes? Well, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin. Why? Because they do not believe on me, he says. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is being judged. He says, I have yet told you many things. 
But there's some things I have to tell you that you're not ready for right now. I wonder how many people in here is not ready this morning. How many people that's watching this on YouTube ain't ready? Hmm. He said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, you shall see me. Because I go to the Father. Who is this comforter? This morning, this comforter we know as the Holy Spirit. Now, do you have the Holy Spirit this morning in your life, or do you have some unholy spirit? There are two different spirits in the world. There's the Spirit of God, and there's the Spirit of Godlessness. There's a spirit of lawlessness in our world today. And this lawlessness says, I'm going to do what I want to do. If I choose to go down here and shoot all these children, that's what this spirit of lawlessness does. If I choose to observe this Easter and, and, and Christmas pagan holidays, that's what the spirit of lawlessness does. If I choose not to come to church, the spirit of lawlessness does that as well. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes, not what's right in God's eyes. They're doing what they want to do, not what God wants us to do, to be doing. I want to show you today, if you truly have God as your higher power, then not only will his name be upon your lips at all times, but you will have been made totally new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If God is your higher power, now I'll tell you something, it's not going to be about you putting on a smiley face. It's not going to be about you saying that you're a Christian. It's not going to be about you going to church. Therefore, what is it about, Marie? Therefore, if any, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. If you have put on Christ this morning, your life is going to be changed drastically. If it hasn't been changed, you have not put on Christ. I can't tell you how many times I've heard preachers stand up and say, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new person. Old things are passing away. Behold, all things are becoming new. That is not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Don't pass me with your lies because I don't need to hear them. Thus saith the Lord. This is what God has to say. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Take a look at yourself this morning. If you haven't been changed, if you do not have a desire to go to church, if you do not have a desire to fulfill every commandment that God said, how can you be that new creature? Because this new creature is going to be all about the Lord. This new creature is going to keep God's church alive and well. This new creature is going to want to support God's church. It's going to want to be there at all times. Just like it's going to want to be in that new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Don't tell me you want to be in that new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven and yet you won't come to church here. Don't tell me you're going to support God's church when it comes down from heaven when you won't support God's church here today. You're a liar. And you're the child of the father of lies. You must be born again. If you have any chance whatsoever of making it into heaven, Jesus said himself in John chapter 3, Nevertheless, I tell you, you must be born again. If you are not born again, there is no way, Jesus says, you can enter into the gates of heaven. 
You are bound for hell this morning. If you don't want to believe it, pick up your Bible and start reading it. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son, the wrath of God abideth upon him. How can you have the Son and not be made a new creature? How can you have Jesus Christ and not be made new again? You have fooled yourself. You have deceived yourself. Put on the whole armor of Christ. Let Christ come into you. Have a, have a full, have a whole life with Christ. Not just a part of a life. You can't have a part of Jesus. You gotta have him all or none. You gotta be a born again Christian or you can't be a Christian at all. Ask yourself this morning. Can I be tempted to get pregnant? I'm a man in here this morning. Can I be tempted to get pregnant? No, because that temptation is not possible for me. Because I'm a man. Now what temptation is possible for you? What are you tempted to do? Serve idols? Lay your lazy self in the bed in the morning when you ought to be in church worshiping God? What are you tempted to do? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, the Bible says there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common unto man. But God is faithful. Because with the temptation, He'll give you a way to escape it. That you'll be able to get through it all. And what are you doing with it? You letting the temptation overrule your life? You letting the temptation to do what the world wants you to do? Take it over you? Then where is Christ at? Where is Christ? He defeated hell, death, hell, and the grave. He's ascended up to heaven. Will you be in heaven with Him? Now you can fake this to some of your friends and some people all you want. But God knows your heart. And so if you fool a few of your neighbors and a few of your family members and such, you still can't fool God. Because He knows who you are and where you're at. Is Christ affecting all your decisions today? Or are all your decisions still being reflected by your old self? Your old self tells you don't bother coming to church. <coughs> your old self tells you to keep your money and you don't need to give anything to the church. Because you need that new car. Like Ananias and Sapphira needed that new four-door camel, I guess. And what did it end up costing them? If we read in the Bible, we find out what it cost them. It cost them a lot more than they really wanted to pay, I'll bet you that. The church we see today is in the book of Revelation, chapter 17. This church we're looking at, Jesus calls this woman a figure of the church. He calls her the great whore. And everybody wants to blame the Catholic church. Everybody wants to say the church in Rome is the great whore. And they're such good people. Well, maybe she is the great whore. And God knows who she is. But I guarantee you one thing. He says she is the mother of whores. So that means all these churches that got their doctrine. All these Santa Claus churches. All these Easter Bunny churches. And all these other good, godless people talking about being a Christian. They're no more Christian than that dirt out there is a Christian. No more Christian than my dog at home is a Christian. They're liars. They do not have the Holy Spirit. They have the unholy spirit. They have unholy ways. They live ungodly. They're unrighteous. Is your home or your money or your pride your first love? Then how can God be your higher power? Because your money is. Or your home, or your big fancy car, or your big breasted woman. What's your higher power this morning? Is it God or something else? Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus speaking here. Wherefore, therefore, now whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But who shall do them and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And except, he says, I say to you, except your righteousness 
exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Don't think you're going to heaven, church. If you don't have God's Holy Spirit in you, where are you going? In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus tells them face to face what he thinks about them. Verse 33. He tells them face to face. He's not ashamed and he's not afraid to speak it out like it is. Verse 33, Marie. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape, escape the damnation of hell? <laughs> now look at yourself this morning. If you don't have God's Holy Spirit, there's where you are sitting at. These Pharisees that Jesus was talking to were probably some of the nicest and some of the best people that you could be around. But they didn't have God's Spirit, and Jesus knew it. They were religious people, but they wasn't saved people. They was on their way to hell, and Jesus knew it. And when a set when a when a pope who is leading over a billion Catholics can stand up and say there is no hell, then I've got a real problem with that. Because Jesus spoke more on hell than anyone else in the Bible, I think. And right here is one verse to prove it. How are you going to escape this hell that the Pope says doesn't exist? Huh. That ought to tell that man he needs to find him another job. Because he's in the wrong occupation. Jesus is God. So ask yourself then, where are you going to be when it's all over? What excuse are you going to try to give me? Oh, I had asthma today. Oh, I had a headache. I had a backache. Oh, my leg hurt. My nose hurt. My ear hurt. We had to stay home and help the baby blow her nose. Whatever excuse that you're going to give God today, you think it's going to work when you stand in front of Him? The day you were born, you were given a day to die. Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed once to die and then the judgment. So what are you going to do on your death day? Are you going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these fine things in your name? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. But Lord, I was a Sunday school teacher. Lord, I, I, I prayed every day. But Lord, I, I was a pastor of the church. Lord, I was a good person. I never went to jail. Lord, I paid tithes. Lord, I helped build the church. And what does Jesus say in verse 22, Marie? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And verse 23? And then will I profess it to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work and that where are you going to depart? There's two places to go when you stand in front of Jesus. Enter into the kingdom of the Lord or someplace else. Where are you planning on going? <laughs> consider where you're going to be when your life is over this morning. But also consider this. If you make your bed to hell, is your children going to be there too with you? Are they going to be burning in hell with you and say, Mama or Daddy, why didn't you tell us the truth? Why did you do what you did, Mama? Why did you let us get into this eternal flame, Mama? Didn't you love us, Mama? What are you going to say? Oh, I didn't want to make waves. I didn't want to get you mad. I didn't want this to happen. I didn't want that to happen. Is that what you're going to say when you lift up your eyes in hell with your children? Why didn't you tell them about the Lord? Why didn't you tell them they should have been in church? Why didn't you tell them they should have been eating off God's Word and the bread of life instead of all this mess in the world? <coughs> in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, You are God, little children, and overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that's in the world. How are you going to overcome the world? To be of God. And then you can overcome the devil to be of God, to be filled with his spirit. He says in verse 5, they are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. <coughs> Beloved, in verse 7, 
Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. You're going to be changed. You're not going to be that old snake in the grass anymore. You're going to have the love of God coming out of you in everything that you do. You're going to be born again. Not of corruptible, but of incorruptible. Verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So don't tell me you love me and you don't want to come to church with me. Don't tell me you love me and you don't want to support God's church. You're a liar. Look at where you're at this morning, church. Are you in with the Lord or are you out with the Lord? Verse 18, There is no fear in love. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? I don't know how to pay my bills if I do this. I don't know how I'm going to do that if I do that. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. He that fear is not made perfect in love. In other words, you haven't been born again. You've got fear you haven't been born again. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? <laughs> Church, I will tell you, there's no real Easter bunny. There's no real Santa Claus. There's no real tooth fairy. And so why have you kept lying to your children all this time? And you wonder why they refuse to believe you when you say, come on, let's go to church and worship the Lord. You wonder why they don't believe God when all you have done is fed them lies their whole life. There is no Easter Bunny. There is no Santa Claus. There's no tooth fairy or any other thing that you've made up to lie to your children. <coughs> In John chapter 14, let us close this morning. John chapter 14, verse 15, Marie. Let us close this morning. This is what the world, this morning is what the world is calling Easter Sunday. <coughs> and they mean it's Easter Sunday. It's Ishtar Sunday. Ishtar Sun God Day. That's what this Easter is about. Ishtar. It's not about our Lord and Savior being risen from the dead. Verse 15 says what? If you love me, what was his commandment? Do this in remembrance of me. Not color eggs, not have Easter bunnies, not have Santa Clauses. <coughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. What is so hard about it? <laughs> he said in verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. You see why they don't have the Holy Spirit? Huh? They're not keeping His commandments. This morning, you're caught in a twist. You can be like the world is, or you can do what the Lord says. You can go out here on your Easter egg hunts. You can go to your Easter cantatas. They claim to talk about our Lord and Savior <laughs> being risen from the dead. Or you can do what God says to do. Do this in remembrance of me. It's so much simpler to do what God says. It's so much simpler to just go to church. Have our church. Have our communion as we have already done this morning. And do what God wants you to do. But no. You want to have it your way. And you can. But you know what? If you have it your way, are you prepared to pay the consequences? You see, Jesus is the way. He's the only way to heaven. No matter what Oprah or anybody else says, He is the only way. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man is getting to heaven except He come through me. Period. I don't care what they say, how good a person they try to be, or whatever else. And the only way you're going to get there is to have God's Holy Spirit living inside of you right now, this morning. So we're going to have an altar call here. And when we have this altar call, what have you been doing with your life? Have you been lying to your children? 
or lie to yourself. You need to make up your mind. Are you really a Christian or not? The more you keep telling yourself you are and not keeping his commandments, what are you proving? You proving you are or you're not. Look at yourself this morning. Examine yourself. If any man is in Christ, you're not like your brothers and sisters who's not here this morning. You're not like your mamas and your daddies and your grandmothers and all the rest of them who were God rejectors and who are probably in hell right now. <laughs> and I know you don't want to hear that. But that's just the honest to God truth. Most of the people are going to end up in hell that's living out here today. Because Jesus said, few there be that find the right way. Because why? They want it their way, they don't want to do it God's way. You can't have it your way. But your way is hell. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But as Joshua said, as for me and my house, what, Marie? We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. So I invite you to come to the altar this morning, if you will, or if you want to. You don't have to. But if you want to come to the altar and you have a need, God is here to hear. He's here to hear what you have to say. We are in His presence. His presence is magnified right now in our eyes, in our sight, in our feeling. And that feeling that you may have in your heart this morning, I don't know if you do or not, but if you do, then you know yourself that God is here amongst us. You can feel His presence. You don't have to wonder, is He here? You can feel His presence. And if you feel His presence this morning, then act upon it. Do the right thing. Come to the altar and declare Him as God. He is the God of your life. He's the God of the living. We're going to be living with Christ. We're, we're going to be with Christ forever. Thank you.